so that we have a version that we can put up online for people that are perhaps unable to attend this lecture um, live. So hopefully what you can see now is um, a screen that has the heading of this lecture which says paradigms and down in the bottom right hand corner um, you should be able to see my picture and we'll keep that there so that you know it is really me. So I think I'll get started and then we can have questions along the way as we go and if you want to ask something as we go you can ask it because I have my mobile phone sitting next to me where I can see the group discussion so I can answer your questions. However, there seems to be about um, a half a minute gap between when I speak and when you see it. Okay, so what are paradigms? So paradigms are a set of forms that have a common root or stem. Now this question of what is a root and what is a stem is something that we could talk about. So in English, we would say that a word like C, as in what you do with your eyes, C, a verb C, is a root, but that in the past tense, it has a different stem. And the past tense stem of this verb is saw. So we have C and we have saw. Okay, now, so this is one uh, analysis of the difference between root and stem. Um, and one of these forms can be selected for use in certain grammatical environments. So for example, in English, in the present tense, we use the form see, but in the past tense, we use the form saw. But a paradigm, so the paradigm has a stem or a root, but it also has a set of other relations things that you add on to the, um, to the stem, to the root, in order to um, express other meanings. So as the definition here, and this comes from a glossary that the Summer, of, in Summer Institute of Linguistics put together, um, a glossary of terms, and I've given you the link there so that you can look at those terms and indeed at times look at other terms. Um, you have a stem and then you have things added to it. So let's have a look at an example. So Sanskrit language is a language that uses paradigms both for its verbs and its nouns. And I'm only going to talk about the nouns right now. Um, and <coughs> Sanskrit paradigms employ a root. We'll see what the root form is at the moment and two types of marking. I said they're singular versus plural, but Sanskrit actually also marks the dual, which is two of an object or two of an entity. So a single entity, two of an entity, and more than two of an entity. So that's actually an error. It should say singular, dual, and plural. And Sanskrit has eight cases, which as you can see, the case names all come from the numbers. So they are case numbers um, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. And the, the first case, the um, Pratama, um, Pratom, I think, in Assamese, um, the first case is the nominative case. When, it, when the word is the subject of verbs, or the subject of many different things. Um, the second case, um, Dvitya, is the object case. So it's direct objects of verbs and also the destination, the motion verbs. So in English, we have to say, go to the forest, but in, um, uh, in Sanskrit, you would say, vanam gachati, well, that's actually Pali, um, but um, a, a similar, very similar language. You use the accusative case for the destination of motion verbs. Then there's the, um, then there's the, the third case, which is the instrument, by means of, also accompanying, so going along with someone. 
Okay, so that's the, that's the third case. And the fourth case is the dative, uh, which in English is the indirect object, gave the flower to him. But notice, go to the forest in Sanskrit would be expressed with the accusative case. So these are the eight cases of Sanskrit. Now, Assamese today doesn't have this same system. And all of these case endings were marked on nouns by adding something to the noun. And so on the next slide, we'll see what this system is. So this is the root form here is nara, meaning man. And this is a masculine, um, this is a masculine noun. And this masculine noun, nara, combines with a whole range of different endings in the singular, dual, and plural to create all these, meeting, all these meanings. So nara, something like nara is the nominative, singular. So if one single man is the subject of something, you would say nara. The vocative nara is used when you are talking to the man. The accusative naram, when the man is an object. So see the man, you would say naram. Narena means by the man or with the man. So uh, if something is done by the man or if somebody is doing, going somewhere with the man, the instrumental is used. Narena. Naraya is the dative to the man, give something to the man. The ablative narat. Narat means um, from. So narat from the man means um, something like, um, uh, how shall I put this? Um, uh, took the book from the man. Narasya means of the man, belonging to the man. Nare means um, at the man. And then this can be done in the dual. Two men, narau, if they're the subject, and also if they're the object. But narabhyam, if they're the instrument. And in the plural, naraha, if there are many men doing something. Naran, if they are the object. So this is what's called a paradigm. And you can put a different stem in place of nara and add these endings to it and these different meanings will still be there. Okay, so this is one example of a paradigm. You do not have this in modern Assamese in the same way. There are um, post positions, things like pora. Um, there is a sort of partial case system, but it doesn't work in exactly the same way. And the good news of Sanskrit is that there are nouns that have their stem in a, uh, nouns that have their stem in u, uh, nouns that have their stem in i, and that are following the masculine, feminine, and neuter genders, and a few irregular ones as well. So it's not quite as straightforward, but there's an awful lot of different endings to learn if you are learning Sanskrit nouns. It's a great fun thing to do. Okay, in Latin, which is the classical language of Europe, whereas Sanskrit is the classical language of India, in Latin, um, you also have this system, but you have fewer cases. So you still have a nominative, the nominative, um, and this is the a, uh, this is the group of nouns uh, in, um, <coughs> so I'm getting some questions. I'm just going to slow down, just going to stop a little bit and see if um, we can answer those questions that are coming. Just had a question from Xenix about how to access. And the answer is you've got to be on the group. Um, so if someone can answer that question, that will be good. Um, and I've got one that I just want to answer. So just um, <coughs> stick with this for a moment. Um, okay. So um, <coughs> So is somebody able to explain the situation to Xenix?
Okay, so let me just go back. I see, Niharika, that you are answering that question. So I'll, I'll get back to talking about this. Um, hmm. Okay, so we are still on the page about the Latin um, paradigm and this is the paradigm in Latin that has now ending in a. Um, <clears throat> and this is the paradigm ending in a that have um, sorry I'm getting messages at the same time and it's a bit hard to concentrate when the messages are coming through and I'm also um, trying to talk. So I'll try and concentrate. Um, <clears throat> nouns ending in a in Latin are often also in the um, feminine gender, something we talked about last week. And the first noun that we learn when we study Latin, I did this when I was in um, school at the age of 10, is the, is the noun meaning a table. And so we see that the um, the basic form of this is mensa, a table. Mensa is the um, nominative case, the case for the subject. Mensa is also the vocative case, the case you use when talking to someone. So with a girl, puella, if you're, if you're saying, oh girl, come and um, do something, um, come, come here, then you would, you would call her puella. Accusative, men some, is when the table is the object. So I built the table or I saw the table, we would use men some. The genitive, the case of possession, the tables. So the table's leg, um, the leg of the table, of the table, men sai. Men sai is also to the table and the ablative form meaning by, with or from the table, men sa should actually have a line over the A um, to show that it's a long A. That's my mistake. I apologize. Should have fixed that. Never mind. And you can see that the noun for girl, puella, follows exactly the same pattern. So we used to, as um, when I was a young boy at school in year six and year seven, I would come go home saying mensa, mensa, mensam, mensai, mensai, mensa. We would learn this. And in the plural, puelai, puelai, puelas, puelarum, puelis, puelis. So the plural of the um, word for girl, when it's a subject, changes from puella to puelai, with an a, 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 e written at the end, puelai. So what do you think might be the plural of tables? when tables are the subject. So since it takes a little bit of time for answers to come, I'm, um, I'm going to give this to you, but the plural form of mensa in the nominative case, in the subject case, would indeed be mensai. Okay, and this pattern works across the board for this language. Now, most of the languages that people listening to this lecture either speak or are studying do not quite do this. Now I want to briefly digress and talk a little bit about what these paradigms mean because people who speak these languages don't learn them like this. The way we learned them in school was by rote, by repeating them over and over again until we got them. But people who learn them as native speakers don't learn them like this. And one, oh, I've forgotten about this slide. So this is the system in Latin for adjectives. The order of the cases is slightly different because they put the vocative at the end. Um, but 
And it's only in the masculine that the vocative is different from the others. But if you want to say a good table and you want that table to be the subject, then you put bona in front of it, which if you can see my cursor moving, bona is here. If on the other hand, you want to say of a good table, then you have to use bonai with the table because the table is a feminine word. If you had a, um, uh, if you had a, a noun that was a masculine noun, like domus, a house, then you would say bonus domus. When you have a feminine noun like mensa or a table, you say bona mensa. So the adjective changes its form according to the gender and the case of the noun that it's agreeing with. So that's an awful lot of forms of the adjective to learn. And they are listed in a different order from the previous slide. This is because there are different, um, different kind of um, traditions for how Latin would be studied. Now, Latin has been studied in schools in countries in Europe for an awful long time. This was the language spoken by the government in the time of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire ruled over almost all of what we now call Europe and North Africa and either West Asia or the Middle East, um, as it was known, countries of Palestine, Israel, Jordan, most of Syria, Lebanon, even Iraq at times, Egypt, Turkey, um, Algeria, uh, Morocco, Spain, France, all of these were ruled from Rome. And um, it was at the height of its power between say about 50 um, before the common era and around 200 after. So for a very long time, very powerful country. So the language of this place stayed as the classical language of Europe in some ways until the present day. It's still used in law. It's still used sometimes in bits of medicine. Um, if you wanted to be a doctor in Australia when I was young, you had to study Latin. And one of the people who studied Latin was British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. You've all heard of him, I'm sure. And you all know that he was very hostile to the idea of Indian independence. Um, and something on which he was quite wrong. Um, but he was a person of uh, lived for a very long time to the age of 91. Um, and one of the things that he did is that he was a very prolific writer. And he wrote history, but he also wrote about his own life. And one of the things that I enjoy sharing with students is what he wrote about his first lesson in school at the age of six. So like many of you, no doubt, he was taken off to study um, in a boarding school at the age of six. Not a very pleasant experience in those days. And as he says, he was taken down into a dark room down at the bottom of the school on a very cold, dark winter's day. And he was given a book by the teacher and the teacher said, this is Latin grammar, you must learn this, and went away. And Churchill writes this, Behold me then with an aching heart, sitting in, seated in front of the first declension. So the first declension is what we call that group of words whose pattern is the same as mensa. Okay, the second declension is that group of words whose pattern is different. So you get different patterns according to which noun it is. And basically that's according to the genders, the thing we talked about last week. So the first declension, and I was about 11 when I had to learn this, um, Churchill was six. So mensa, a table, subject. Mensa, o table, when talking to a table. Mensum, table, an object. Mensai, of a table. Mensai, two or four a table, mensa, by, with, or from a table. So he learned it. But he says, what on earth did it mean? It seemed absolute rigmarole. But there was one thing I could always do, I could learn by heart. So what he did is he learned it. 
And this is what we do when we learn languages today. We have to learn some things by heart. In due course, the master returned. Have you learned it? He asked. I think I can say it, sir, I replied and gabbled it off. He seemed so satisfied with this, I was emboldened to ask a question. What does it mean, sir? Just remember that. What does it mean? We'll come back to that in a minute. It means what it says. Mensa, a table. I inquired, but what does O table mean? Mensa, O table, is the vocative case. This is the teacher speaking, right? O table. You would use that in addressing a table. And seeing that he was not carrying with him, me with him, you would use that in speaking to a table. But I never do. I blurted out in honest amazement. I never do. You are impertinent. You will be punished and punished, let me tell you, very severely, was his conclusive rejoinder. Such, Churchill writes, was my first introduction to the classics from which I have been told many of our me cleverest men derive so much solace and profit. Now, there's a lot of interesting things in this comment, and there's a reason why I have put this here for you. The part that's of most interest to us is the part where it says, O oh, table, you would use that in addressing a table. You would use it in speaking to a table. But, as Churchill rightly pointed out, he never does speak to tables. And most of us don't speak to tables. So why then do you have a word which allows you, which is specially in the form for speaking to tables? And the reason for that is that the paradigm has a place for everything, even the things that we would never use. So in the Latin and also in the Sanskrit systems, there is a vocative case form. There is a form for speaking to something. But we don't talk to tables. We don't talk to stones. We don't talk to houses, usually. Um, long ago, we didn't talk to computers, but I'm doing that right now. So maybe this will change over time. But this is one of the reasons why paradigms are so interesting, because they require us to learn forms that we might not ever use. And speakers don't, the people who learn language from children don't learn them in this way. So they, they would never learn that there is a specific form for speaking to the table, which incidentally is the same as the subject form, but it wouldn't be if it was a different noun. They don't learn it in this way. They learn it by usage. So that's why when you go and study a language that you, that has paradigms in it, it can be quite difficult to elicit them from speakers. Now I know that Deep and Niharika and Polach um, and uh, are all listening at the moment. And I think you've all been present when I've tried eliciting paradigms. I think Polach long ago, we gave you a list of sentences to get from people, and this was with a purpose of finding out how they do this in some of the Tangsa languages. It's actually quite difficult. And we'll see shortly some examples of why this is. Okay, so I always find it's rather nice talking about Winston Churchill's response. But I also want to mention the other thing that you learn on day one in Latin, and that is, the verb paradigm, amo, amas, amat, amamus, amatis, amant. So, amo, I love, amas, you love, amat, he, she, or it loves, amamus, we love, amantis, you love, amatis, sorry, you love, and amant, they love. Now, Actually, if I'd given you the Sanskrit paradigm, you would have noticed some similarities. Um, you would have seen that there is something similar between Latin and Sanskrit. And this fact was noticed by um, a person called William Jones, who was a government official in Kolkata 
in 17, give or take 1780, something like that. And he gave a lecture at the Asiatic Society in Kolkata in which he pointed out that Sanskrit and Latin were related languages. And one of the reasons for pointing this out is that the verb paradigms were similar because William Jones had learned Sanskrit and Latin and Persian and ancient Greek and knew what these similarities were. Now, it turns out if you want to say the girl loves the table, we can now do that. And I haven't made a slide for this, but if you remember the subject form of girl was puella, the object form of table was mensam, with an M on the end of it, and amat means he, she, or it loves. Now it turns out in Latin, you can put those words in any order. You can say puella, mensam, amat, girl, table, loves. You can say amat, puella, mensam, loves, girl, table. You can say amat, mensam, puella, loves, table, girl. Any of those orders are possible and they're possible because each word has its own marker indicating the connection between it and the rest of the sentence. Puella must be the subject because it has a, mensam must be the object because it has um, amat is the verb for he, she or it loves, in this case she loves. So if we just go quickly back and look again at that, we see that puella is the nominative case or subject case for um, the, the, the word for girl and mensum is the accusative or object case for the word for table. So, puella amat mensum, mensum amat puella, all these means the girl loves the table. Not a very interesting sentence because, but those are the only words we know in Latin, but you can see perhaps even from this discussion that we're all already on the road to learning this language. Okay, now let's have a look at something else. And I'm going to ask you if you can to answer some questions about this. And as I ask you those questions, you need to be aware that there is about a one minute gap between the time that I speak and the time that you're hearing this. So when I ask you the question, um, you're not going to be able to answer it straight away because of this gap. And I'm going to tell you about the Wemba Wemba language, once spoken on both sides of the Murray River upstream of Swan Hill, in particular around Lake Boga in the state of Victoria in Australia. Now you'll have to look on a map to find where that is, but you can find it. And we're going to give you a table of the possessive suffix forms. And these were worked out by my very dear friend, Louise Herkus, who <clears throat> was born in January 1926 and died in um, May 2018 when I was off having a holiday in Egypt. I had switched off the internet for three weeks and when I opened it and there were 555 or thereabouts emails, the only one which I was really sorry I had not seen was the one that told me that she had passed away. We worked closely together towards the end of her life on doing research, but she started collecting information about this language, Wemba Wemba, back in 1962. Um, one of the greats of linguistics. And I also wanted to show you um, a photograph of what the countryside looks like where <clears throat> this language is spoken. So it's very dry country, much drier than Assam. Um, the annual rainfall in that area would be, well, I think you, you could get that much rain in a single day in Assam. But this particular tree that I hope you are now able to see, you can see a little gap in the middle of the tree. 
And the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people, the tribal people long ago made the tree grow like this so that it would mark the fact that the, this was the boundary between two tribal areas. And I was taken out there by one of the members of that community. They don't use language every day now. They are trying to bring it back. But I wanted you to get an idea of the situation of this. A very dry country compared to the very wet country where all of you are. Now, Wemba Wemba has the following system. So, let's go through this table. So this is a language quite similar to Sanskrit in that it has singular forms, dual forms, and plural forms. First person singular is marked by ek. First, a second person singular, which means belonging to you, one person, is marked by in. Third person singular is marked by uk. In the dual form, there are two different forms, angalak and angalakang. Angalak is what we call the first person inclusive. What that means is it includes the person listening. So it's, it refers to two people, two people, and those two people are the speaker and one person being um, listened, who is listening. So suppose I was speaking to Asifa and I said, we too own something, I would use the form angalak. But if I was speaking to Asifa and was saying, me and my wife, Kim Siu, some of you have met, are, doing, are owning something, I'd have to add angalakang because that excludes the person that I'm speaking to. Alak means your two, and bulak means their two. And then the plural forms, angorakang means everybody except you, or everybody's except yours. Angorak means belonging to everyone, atak means belonging to all of you, and chanak means belonging to all of them. I can answer questions about this later if that's too much information too quickly. Now, here's the question that we're going to ask. If the word one means a boomerang, what does one ek mean? Okay, now you can text the answer to this on the group discussion that we're having. If one means a boomerang, and it's pronounced one, we spell W-A-N because it's a more phonemic writing system. If one means a boomerang, what does one ek mean? And as I say, you might have answered already, but the answer hasn't come to me yet. So I want to know what does one ek mean. So the way the paradigm works, you take the root form, which in this case is one, and you add something to it. So what do you have to add to get the meaning? What, what, what does adding ek mean? So ek is in the table and it's described as first singular exclusive. It's in the exclusive column because it does not include the listener. This is a particular feature of these languages. And some languages of Northeast India also have this feature. The first person plural might or might not include the listener. The um, Tangsa languages, for example, have that feature in their pronouns. So what does one ek mean? I'm hoping that everyone is still able to hear this and the answer is coming through. <coughs>
Anyone can write something? Okay, well, Wanek means my boomerang. Um, one of you might actually get the answer to me before, like, because of this time lag, it's a bit um, confusing, because ek is what you add on to a noun to mean my, that is the first singular exclusive, well, exclusive means excluding the listener. And of course, if it's my, that is excluding the listener. Okay, so let's try another one. Wanuk. What does Wanuk mean? Um, if you can write in the chat, do try to do so. So, Uk. Uk is the third person singular ending. What does wanuk mean? These are possessive sus suffixes. What does wanuk mean? Um, so his or her boomerang, that's right. If it was their boomerang, if it was their boomerang, um, and thank you, wanek is um, one plus the first singular possessive, wanek means my boomerang. If it was their boomerang, it would depend on whether it belonged to two people, in which case it would be one bulak, or more than two people, in which case it would be one tanak. And this is one of the ways that paradigms work. So wanuk means his, her, or its boomerang. If a boomerang belongs to, well, who knows? I mean, this language doesn't distinguish him, her, and it. And the last one is a bit trickier, wanangalak. What does wanangalak mean? So we know, it, we know it means boomerang, but whose boomerang is it? Wanangalak. Yeah, the, the reason why I want to test out how you are... Um, looking into these is that being able to read a table like this and interpret it does take a moment. So, wanangalak, what might wanangalak mean? This is the last one we're going to do in this way. So you find angalak in the table, it's here. So it's a dual form, relates to only two people. And it's a first person form which means it includes the speaker and it is inclusive, which means it includes the listener. So wanangalak means I, our first person dual inclusive boomerang from Niharika, that is the correct answer. And that means your and mine, if I'm talking to one person. So if I'm talking to Niharika and the rest of you are listening and I say to Niharika, wanangalak, that means I'm talking about a boomerang that Niharika and I own, but nobody else. Now, Asifa's translation, our boomerang is correct because that's the way we'd say it in English. But actually, our in English has multiple meanings and Wemba Wemba makes it clear who our is. So if, for example, I talk about, um, I'm sitting with you all at a conference somewhere and, for example, we're all at the Northeast Indian Linguistic Society conference back in February and I say it's time for our dinner then that form of our includes me and the people listening and everyone. So we would use the first person plural inclusive form, 
angurak to add to dinner. If on the other hand, I say to you that my wife and I are going to eat our dinner at seven o'clock, which we will be doing um, there in abouts, I would have to use the first person dual exclusive because that doesn't include any of you and does include my wife and there's just two of us. If on the other hand, I said to you that my uh, nephew James and his girlfriend are coming for lunch on Sunday and we are going to have our lunch together. They are allowed to come for lunch here now. Um, the rules have been relaxed a little. Then I would use angurakang because it's a first person plural excluding all of you. I realize this is a little tricky to understand but languages are interesting. Okay now the Mashaung language one of the ones that I have been researching, and I did invite um, Wang Lung Mashang, who, who gave me this information years ago, to join us, whether he has or not. But I've written these words not in the writing system that the um, Mashang people use, but in the writing system, in the phonetic writing system. And what we can see here is two parts of a paradigm. We have some verbs, koar, weep, um, nei, laugh, um, jap, uh, yap, sorry, jap, I think, to stand, naum, to sit, ba, to fly, sa, to eat, to eat rice or bananas or fish or eggs, not other things, um, nung, to drink, gu, to give, gu, to steal, and gu to bite, the 10 different verbs, which I have pronounced okayly. Now, in the imperative, which is commanding one person to do something, if you command one person to weep, you would say, hua go. If you combine one person to laugh, you'd say, no go, go, sorry. If you commanded one person to stand, you'd say, or yep, go. One person to sit, now go. One person to fly, ba go. One person to eat, however, is sa show. Now I'm going to ask you the question, why are some of these marked with go and some of these marked with show? Now some of you might know the answer to this because you've heard me talk about this before, but if you don't know the answer to this, um, try and work it out. Sa show means you eat something. It's in the form of command. Nung show means you drink something in the form of a, a command. Go show you give something to someone probably. Um, go show means show actually low tone it should be. Um, my pronunciation not perfect means you singular. Go and steal something. Steal it. We would would put a um in um, exclamation mark and gulk show bite it. So why do some of these have go and some of them have show? Anyone got any ideas about why that might be? And the hint here is to look at what these verbs mean. Weep, laugh, stand, sit, and fly. How are they different from eat, drink, give, steal, and bite? Any ideas? Well, if anyone does know the answer, even if you've seen me talk about this before, you can also add your answer. Yes. So Niharika has made the point transitive versus intransitive verbs. So the bottom half of the table, eat, drink, give, steal, and bite, these are all verbs that have 
objects. So we'd say, eat it, drink it, give it, steal it, bite it. Whereas the top five are all intransitive verbs. They don't have objects. Um, you can, well, weeping or crying, laughing, standing. You can stand on something, but you don't stand something. You, you can sit on something, but you don't sit something. Um, you can fly through something or to somewhere, but you don't fly something. So this is indeed the case. Now, when I was collecting this information back in, I think it was 2012, uh, from Wang Lung Mosang, I remember very well that we were sitting in a particular house, um, and I think that house has been rebuilt since then. We were sitting in the back kitchen, and <clears throat> I kept asking, so how do you make the command form of this verb, of this verb, of this verb, and some, some were coming out go, and some were coming out show. And I said, why, why are some go and why are some show? And then I went through a list, and at a certain point I said to him, I think the reason is that the ones with go do not have an object, and the ones with show do. And he said to me that he had been wondering about this for many years, to understand why this was the case and had not been able to work the reason out. And this is where linguistics is important because we, we look for the patterns in things that the speakers do not necessarily search for. And paradigms are all about patterns. You don't learn as a child Mashaung language by looking at a table like this. You don't learn Latin by looking at the table we looked at before, or Wemba Wemba by looking at the table of, of the possessive markers, or indeed in Sanskrit by looking at the table of endings. But as linguists, we study those and we work those out. Okay, so our final task for today is to see if we can work out what these words at the bottom mean. Now I've slightly adjusted the form of the language to remove the tone marks. Um, <clears throat> but if we have here, kwa taung, I will weep, weep, kwa ti, we will weep, kwa tu, you singular will weep, kwa tun, you plural will weep, kwa tu, he, she, or they will weep. So if I say that ba means to fly, what does ba ti mean? <clears throat> and this actually turns out to be not as difficult as you would expect it to be. So if ba means fly, what does ba ti mean? If you look at the table above. Anyone can answer this? Bati. Bati means we will fly. Okay, now, yes. Now I'm going to be asking you the answers to all the others here as well. Bato. Bato. The second one should therefore mean, and I'm also going to be asking you for ngang tu, ngang ti, and ngang tun. So we're kind of, um, <clears throat> because there's this half minute gap between when I ask the question and you can answer it, it's, so number one was bati, that means we will fly. Number two, bato means what? Number three, ngang tu means what? Bati is we will fly, yes, that's right. Yasmin, what is Bato mean? What does ngang tu mean? What does ngang ti mean? And what does ngang tun mean? So 
The answer you will fly has been given for Bato, but there is something more there because while that is an English translation, it doesn't tell you everything because um, <coughs> Bato is you singular will fly, exactly. So this is, this brings up an important point while the rest of you are answering the other questions. That there is no direct translation. If, if you have, uh, if you have a, um, a sentence in English, um, so suppose you are talking to someone and you ask them, um, when will you fly to Guwahati? Something we are not doing at the moment, but one day we will again. We might be able to again. When will you fly to Guwahati? Will you fly? In English, we just say, you will fly. That's the positive form. But to translate this into Mashong, mash we have to know, is it singular or plural? Okay, so Ngang Tu means, yes, thank you. Ngang Tu means, what does Ngang Tu mean? What does Ngang Ti mean? And what does Ngang Tun mean? And these are the, I think, final questions for this lecture, which has probably gone on too long. <clears throat> but it's sort of more fun knowing that you're listening to me as I do it. So I think what I'm going, yes. So Ngang Tu does indeed mean he, she, they will sit. And this is, this is an interesting feature of Mashang. There is no difference between singular and plural for the third person. And another language that does not distinguish number in marking of verbs is of course Assamese on the verb because you distinguish whether it is you in a formal sense or an informal sense, you distinguish whether it is he or she, and you distinguish I and we, but the form for I and we is the same. There is no person, there's no number distinction in Assamese. And that number distinction is also missing in Mashang for the third person. So, um, Nili Moy's answers, you will fly, he, she, they will sit, we will sit, you, plural, will sit. These are indeed correct. And I can now put the answers there. Excellent. Okay, so that's the end of that. And what I can do now, I think, is to stop the screen sharing and move back to, you can see me. <coughs> um, and you can also see on my wall behind, the first of all, Rira uh, Tangsa calendar. Secondly, this is the Australian Sign Language Auslan finger spelling system. So, um, A, B, C, D, etc. And this is a photo of my four nephews, each with their girlfriends um, and fiancés in, in a couple of cases. And then above that, <coughs> you see some of my musical instrument collection. This is the house in which I live. Um, so, what's the time? I think this might be a good minute to stop this part of it and I can answer questions in the group discussion if there are any. Well actually I'm going to have to go in a minute. This took much longer than I thought. Speaking too long. Apologies. <laughs>